in this talk, I, I wanted to shift the stress away from thinking about art in terms of production that's happened um, at a fixed historical moment in the past. It's having been made. Um, to thinking about art as permanently in making in the imagination. After all, one of the things I think Gabriella Roscoe's work dramatizes is the way things come into being as objects and enter into circulation as objects, um, remade, as it were, each time they're shown. And here, um, I'm showing you a photograph of part of the recent Beauborg version of the show now at Tate Modern. The image before was uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York. What I want to think about is why, the, why and how um, the question of madeness can still matter now under conditions of globalization that would maybe seem far from propitious in many ways. Um, at least the kinds of making that Orozco is involved with, why do they matter? And why does that seem an important question to ask? After all, there was a time in the early 90s when Orozco's work was fairly easily assimilated uh, to a discourse of nomadism and relational aesthetics, as problematic as that might always have been. Um, but the more recent developments, or some of the more recent developments in his work, are certainly hard to contain within it now. And I, I'll say quickly that I'm not going to try, and nor would I want to, contain it within those discourses, and why would one want to? But instead, I want to stick with what I see as the recalcitrance of the work, stick with the logic of the work, to see what's at stake for us as subjects in it now. Adorno once wrote in Aesthetic Theory, that was his late great book on aesthetics written in the 1960s when modernism had all but disintegrated about him that, and this is a quote, radically artifactual art brings us face to face with the problem of makeability. And Gabriella Orozco's work seems to me to speak to the problem of makeability now, but in a particular kind of com conversation with makeability as it's been imagined by the historical avant-garde. And the second aspect of Orozco's work that I'd like to address is this, how it relates to the legacies of abstraction and how we think of the position and possibilities of geometric abstraction now. I know that might sound slightly ridiculous. It hardly sounds like a question for now. And Orozco himself never, never sees himself as an abstract artist and nor is he. But I want to try, try to say something about his involvement with what's left of earlier, even obsolete types of geometricity in order to address what I see as the still pervasive and in many ways retrogressive way in which oppositions between figuration and abstraction, between the so-called documentary and the so-called formalist, um, the way for me they're simply too crude to deal with ambitious art now. So I want to lay my stress, I guess, on the aspects of his work that are most resistant to current documentary modes or other iconographies of globalization, whilst in my view engaging most acutely with its structural conditions. Now arguably the move from international to transnational models make quite different demands, not just of a Mexican artist working within a global art economy, but any artist working under the conditions of contemporary art now. So in this context, I want to introduce not only the question of resistance, but also of art's resilience under these, in many ways, difficult circumstances. And that's a question that hasn't stayed still. And how could it, touching as it does on processes of mass production and consumption and the movement of global capital? Gabriel Orozco once said in an interview that people often forget that his aim is to disappoint. 
And I want to take that as a, a serious, critical proposal. In some ways, Orozco's more recent work, and especially some of the work I'm going to look at, inevitably disappoints a critical constituency wedded to nomadism or to locality and its specificities, precisely because it locates specificity elsewhere. Just as it, what I'm calling it, not enoughness can also disappoint an aesthetic that's fundamentally wedded to a metaphorics like T.J. Clark's in his recent critique in the London Review of Book, Books, um, the, the journal T.J. Clark reviewed Orozco's work and the refrain throughout this review was that it was not enough for him. Um, so I want to start by asking what would it be to try to think these questions through, not in relation to the work which originally and most obviously fueled relational aesthetics, but in relation to his more recent work, work made over the last five or ten years since the early 2000s. And of course I mean the paintings. Uh, they were f actually first shown, they first appeared at the show at the Serpentine in 2004. And it was for that show that I actually first wrote on Orozco and I was as surprised, even the curators were surprised, as anyone um, that he should include paintings in this exhibition. After all, this was the artist who had always said he was absolutely not interested in painting, nor would he ever make paintings just as he would never use plinths, and so on. Now, they'd begun elsewhere. What became the paintings, like this one, had begun as something else. And it was hard to see then where and how um, they would end up. The first sign of them was a real sign. The light signs that he made at the first Quenju Biennial in 1995. These were made as light boxes and placed in the city of Kwanju in South Korea. On the ground, you can see propped against buildings. And he'd worked with a local sign maker and made these on site in less than a week, drawing on circle drawings he'd made in his notebooks, kind of doodles. Now, they're neither Neo Geo nor Op Art, but they recall the geometric language of constructivism now migrated in place and time to be one sign, sign amongst any number. Here's one on the wall of a gallery rather than the street where it began its life. The first paintings, on the other hand, come much later. After some full starts, he reduces the colours to four, replacing the yellow by gold. Um, sorry, of my ordering. Um, one of the first, before he developed the system, was this one. Can you see it? Very small on the right, lying on that working table, um, flat on its back, a little canvas with concentric circles on it. And it's next to a whole host of other things shallow plaster bowl shapes, other experiments with painted elements on flat surfaces like board or on curved organic, organic shapes like these clay shapes. You can see the collection of things as a dispersal as much as a collection, both spatially and temporally, scattered through many years of work. Now, the tables, the working tables as they're called, have been likened to 3D notebooks. Orozco calls them platforms for action. Benjamin Buclo has said they present the full range of possibilities of sculpture now, consisting as they do of projects, models, trial pieces, failures, leftovers. And if we think about the idea of mobility in Orozco's work, then the tables seem to animate as much as anything the mobility of these circuits, these gaps and distances and intervals between things as they're laid out and distributed across a flat surface. Benjamin Buchler talked of the possibilities for sculpture, not a reference, not a single reference to flat things, to flat abstract things like this, 
But I'm interested in how painting fits or doesn't fit those circuits and whether when placed flat on a table it can be called a painting at all. I think it maybe can't. And maybe they have nothing even to do with painting as a means of art making and more to do with art as a form of world making. After all, laid out like this, flat, they're just one thing amongst many other things. And amongst those other things, the table's work seems to be to pose that question, but also poses it amongst what? A group of not-so-random objects that are mostly very, very provisional. They hardly amount to artworks in their own right. Um, or if they aren't so provisional, they seem to become so when placed on the table surface in conjunction with everything else. Like the painting, of course, or the little black and white painted panel just beyond it, which becomes something else, I think, precisely by not being attached to a wall. Then on the other side of the table, there's strings of colour swatches amongst other trial runs, segments of colour pieced together and stuck with sellotape, and so on. It's not as if the table only reflects on painting, but painting is one, painting and colour, um, are some of several possibilities laid out here. And in a sense, the colour samples, I think, say something about the thinking through materials, including colour as a material that's at work um, on the working table. <coughs> Of course, the role of the colour swatch is to immediately take colour out of an expressive Id idiom, uh, just as Duchamp had in Tum, um, the famous last painting that he made in 1918, in which a colour chart rains down across a panel filled with the painted shadows of his own suspended ready-made. I'm not trying to say exactly that Orozco was influenced by Duchamp, but the work that he makes characteristically leapfrogs back to the moment of the historical avant-garde when colour is radically undermined as a vehicle for affect and emotion. Colour becomes a prime commodity like any other, dramatised perhaps most vividly by Maholi Naj in his famous telephone pictures, he made this one in Berlin in 1923, where he famously rang up a, um, a sign manufacturer and ordered the painting over the phone and ordered three identical ones, except in three different sizes. Um, this one was made of, they were made of porcelain enamel on steel. So using the telephone was a new technology a bit like the way Orozco uses the computer to maximise the possible variations of the elements in his paintings. So he doesn't have to do any of the choosing or selecting that painting usually entails. And colour kind of becomes exemplary of that kind of choosing. Now, the first working table that Orozco made was very different to the one I, I showed you a moment ago, there's no paintings. Um, there's a little DS toy car, a shoebox, some plasticine shapes molded round or oranges, that sort of thing. Some black silhouettes painted on a polystyrene block, if you can see that in the middle of the first table, like something from a car instruction manual. Um, but if we go back, sorry, I put it in the wrong order just managed to get this image. This is actually a page from his notebooks from 1995 uh, to six. Um, and this is a page in his notebooks when he was thinking that first table out, okay? The Zurich working table that was made in uh, 1996. So this is 1995 and you can see those light signs from Quan Ju on the wall behind him in some kind of relationship already with the table, as if the circular elements that he used in signs but had been doodling with for years, a kind of mobile schema that can migrate from surface to surface. His notebooks, and this is a characteristic page with photographs and notes, um, the notebooks are full of them, these little circular schema and they'd already crept onto banknotes, tickets, and so on. Um, 
just as volatile, just as mobile as an airline ticket, I think. Or here in a page from his notebooks, you can see, if we go ahead, um, another page from the notebooks, you can see the circular patterns juxtaposed with the diagram of the dashboard and steering wheel from the manual for the DS car. Now, there's something about Orozco's work that makes it very difficult to stick with the one thing you're trying to focus on, something that always makes it disperse and proliferate into everything else. I'm trying to resist it, but as you can see, not managing very well. But I think it is part of the dynamic of the work, where art, where art making and world making coincide at, at some crucial um, interface. You see, I'm trying to talk about the paintings and failing. And one reason is that I think there's always something dragging away from the wall in Orozco's work, dragging the eye to a horizontal surface, to a table, a platform, a floor. That's important, I think, and I'll come back to it. The other reason, I guess, is that as soon as I try to explain the system in the paintings, I sort of end up getting lost in it. Um, Orozco thought that the most successful of the paintings that he made in that serpentine show was one called the Samurai Tree, and this is one of the variations on that. And it's a format that he went on to produce so many variations of since that time. Um, the variations are all the same format, but the colors are in a different order. And they're always blue, red, gold, and white. And the system, which I won't go into in detail, is basically and most simply that moving from the center out, the colors shift, the colors change according to the knight's move in chess. So two forward and one across, either to the left or the right. So the paintings are dead mechanical in that sense. The permutations are all worked out on a computer, but they're also maybe the most handmade of his works. Um, they're paintings, they're made by hand. They're just not handmade by him. They're handmade by an assistant. There's no big production team for Orozco's work, but he has a few assistants. So they're probably the most handmade things he makes, but not handmade by him. Um, and they're mass produced to the extent that they're made by an assistant to his specification. And he said they're not paintings, but diagrams. He said that what he hates about paintings are the kinds of decisions they require you to make. So in a sense, these really aren't paintings. I'm not so sure. But at least the point is that their status as paintings is kind of unstable. Orozco had started off as a painter, but abandoned painting in the mid-'80s. He'd made abstracts. He'd made strange little fragment, fragments of icon paintings in the middle, in the beginning, the start of the 80s, using gold and schematic patterns. Um, that he's recently, in the last few years, come back um, to using gold leaf and artisanal uh, techniques in his paintings is significant, I think. Um, they're actually prepared. This is an example of one of the more recent works that are rather smaller and use gold leaf rather than gold paint. And they're prepared by a traditional workshop in Mexico City. This is actually the workshop where they are made. But that idea of a a gold monochrome is obviously also an idea with a big history. And the idea of the gold monochrome has a history from Fontana and Klein through you know, Warhol's monochrome iconic gra grounds for the Marilyn portraits. At the same time, the gold invokes the history of, mono of the monochrome in uh, Mexico, especially the work of Matthias Goeritz, who work with the architect Barragan on their famous towers of Satellite City at the end of the 1950s, as well as this large gold um, 
monochrome in the Camino Real Hotel in Mexico City, which has been there since 1968. Barragan also filled his house with monochromes. Well, fill, filled is probably not quite the right word. He, he, he has these um, amazing Goritz monochromes in his house in Mexico City, like this one at the, stop of the, at the top of the stairs. Goritz was German, but moved to Mexico in 1949. Um, they're quite a bit smaller um, than the Samurai Tree series. There are one or two, I think, in the Tate exhibition, but they're still square. They're made of gold leaf over panel, prepared in the traditional way. Rather than an effect of preciousness, maybe think of the contradictions, the fact of a computer-generated image repeated endlessly, yet made according to highly developed and traditional skills, craft skills, New and old technologies of making and viewing are brought together, the artisanal and the digital, into an odd and awkward mix when it comes down to it, the one collapsing into another along a, maybe a kind of fault line between a computer program and a traditional workshop. And because they're so pristine, you know, the shine so immaculate, where old and, and what's new tend to collapse in the process. And the differences that emerge because of the different colorways don't produce, I think, aesthetic nuance either. As paintings, they don't quite yield up what paintings are meant to. But it's this work that I'd really like to dwell on. Um, made a, a couple of years um, earlier than the painting we've just looked at on panel. This is in the exhibition. This is the Eye of Go of G.O. Gabriel Orozco from 2005. And in order to think about what it is for Orozco to make a painting like this, um, as I've said, he wouldn't even call it a painting, but whatever it is, it's canvas and it's painted. And what is it for art now to engage in conversation with this range of hybrid sources, very often obsolete, as I've suggested, in some ways, gold leaf is the most obsolete of all, even more so than a DS or a abstract paint or abstract painting itself, which after all you can think of as a, an obsolete medium. Well, I think it raises the question of what it means to invoke not just a single modernity, but multiple modernities simultaneously, you know, not on a timeline of a linear historical development, but more in keeping with the way a strip of color swatches is you know, strictly non-hierarchical, but in absolute equivalence. Earlier technologies of painting, which seem to be of the past, but are of course presented to us within our lived present, and new technologies which appear to collapse distances. So the paintings are not made by him, but by assistants in Paris or Mexico City. It's the same format, except that there's one additional circle in the top left in the Eye of Go, not entirely symmetrical with the one on the right, and of course no colour, just black and white. So I think it's like an, an eclipse. In the Tate, Sorry, I, I thought I had my images in the right order, but I changed them around. So in the Tate, um, I'm, I'm sure many of you will have seen the exhibition. It's in a room with a fan circling on the ceiling with toilet paper flying around. And together with a lot of drawings that seem to swarm with molecular patterns of little black circles like this. Then these are actually pages from his notebooks again with acetate sheets stuck in over photographs. And then again, here's an acetate sheet that at one point was just pinned up on the wall next to his working space in his apartment. You can see that these kind of repeat and mon modify the elements of the eye of Go. And then in the Tate exhibition, there's this small piece next to the painting, a drawing from 10 years previously, from 1995, where you can see that idea 
beginning. And of course, 1995 was the same year as the Quanju light signs. It's in a sheet of A4, like all the other drawings, um, like the drawings on graph paper. And there are plenty of similar ones using this basic format, but um, subject to endless kind of variation. Orozco has been adamant that he doesn't like op art, but it does have a very slight op effect of making the points vibrate a bit, not so unlike the way in which a late Mon Mondrian, you know, when Mondrian makes <coughs> paintings like this one, the black lines of the grid get closer together and the effect is to dazzle the eye a bit at the nodal points of the grid. And so point by point, they're not painting in Mondrian's sense. They're, they're not provisional, but absolutely formulaic. I mean, to say that Gabriela Roscoe's are absolutely formulaic and worked out on a computer program, which is not the case um, with a Mondrian. But I don't simply want to bring Orozco's paintings back into the fold of geometric abstract painting, and nor do I want to discount that relationship entirely. Arguably, Orozco's work might make us think differently about Mondrian in the process, or at least um, it makes us think perhaps differently about the contemporary critical crisis which seems at times to be beset by this reductive opposition between formalism and anti-formalism, you know, still intoxicated by iconography and still resistant to the more complex and strange possibilities of geometric abstraction. One of the fundamental things about abstraction is not the modernist claim that everything comes to activate the flat surface, but that in fact what is activated by structuring the surface like this is the space in front of the painting, the space between the viewer and the flat canvas attached to the wall as a kind of bodily space. It's the historical avant-garde that first demonstrates that this is the space of painting. And Mondrian's first grids accent the plane but only in so far as they also reflect back on the presence of a, you know, a, a viewer moving before it. Um, the more insistent the gridded lines and the more attention to their relative thicknesses and thinnesses, however subtle, the more this was the case. Um, this is actually Mondrian's composition with red, yellow and blue that he began in Paris in 1938, continued in London, and finished in New York when he arrived there in 1940. So as a work, it's also kind of mobile in that sense of the way in which it was made. In some respects, it seems to me that this sense of abstraction making a claim to the body of the viewer in a singularly different manner from other types of painting is its lasting legacy, but one that's rarely talked about. But of course, it's not the grid which seduces Orozco so much as the circle. For instance, Ros Rodchenko's circle paintings that are no longer paintings in the sense that a Kandinsky is, and they become a sort of diagram um, at the same time as a means to almost trace planetary movements in some of them, um, not so much this one. Um, this one is all factura, all texture. Um, Rodchenko thought of this as a kind of materialist practice as against Malevich's utopian um, visionary imagining his way into the future. Um, but my point is that the circle, as much as the square, the cross, the grid, become tokens of futurity, of the possibility of world making into a, an imagined future. This is actually uh, Malevich's plane in rotation from 1915, usually called Black Circle, and it floats in space on a white ground, you know, off center, suspended in space. I think it's significant, as I've said, that Orozco's work leapfrogs back to the historical avant-garde of the early 20th century like this, with barely a nod, with not even a nod, to the American neo-avant-garde of the 
40s, 50s and 60s. No nod to Pollock, no nod to minimalism, for instance. Um, let's cut back to a working table and see the slices of black and white, one word picture invoking Dada typographic works, just as the debris across the table that we saw earlier kind of invoked Dada ephemera. And then the small version of the eye of Go cut into some kind of thin slice. In a way, Orozco's obsession with movement and rotation tracks back to that moment in the early 20th century that proposed the vast utopian vision in a small square picture, convulsed by the disproportion of that proposal. <coughs> and rather than buckle under, the avant-garde's failure to fulfill its promise or continue it blindly. I think Orozco takes its failure as a condition of how you can continue to make work, if that makes sense. Alexander Calder had made mobiles, and it was actually Duchamp who first named his kinetic work, this one of 1931, mobile. Though in the end, the currents in the air were enough to make the works move for Calder. I think there's a sense in the paintings that Orozco <coughs> makes that he wants a three-dimensionality. Um, he doesn't want a flat surface, even in the eye of Go, which seems to flatten its elements into a single silhouette. The black circular elements are susceptible to movement but they also create a kind of movement in vision as they so very slightly oscillate before our eyes, like the Mondrian effect, as I said. But of course, um, that's exacerbated by the juxtaposition with the fan above, with the spiraling uh, toilet paper whirling around the room, which creates uh, disturbances in the air. This is the tape, not a very good shot. This allows you to see the Boborg installation with the ventilator, with these whirling strips of toilet paper um, moving around. Um, there's nothing in Orozco's painting, there's nothing literally tactile, there's no trace of brushwork, zero texture. Um, there's nothing tactile about that painting, The Eye of Go, yet I want to say it's fully material and bodily in a way that it corresponds to one's height, uh, to a near though crucially slightly skewed and uneven um, symmetry, and to these kinds of slight visual disturbances. The geometric becomes not the opposite of the organic, but the one becomes an extension of the other. In some respects, of course, the logic here is reminiscent of Oitasika's metaschemas from the late 1950s, in the way the surface is made up of geometric elements which disturb the surface, even as it constructs it, and creates a movement that oscillates precisely in that space between the work and the spectator's field of vision. Except, of course, whilst Oitasika would later move from painting towards his bolides and his object world. Um, for Orozco, it's only after he's created a very particular kind of object world from the late 80s, the beginning of the 90s, that he finally reintroduces the residual elements of a tradition of geometric abstraction inextricably bound to multiple and various modernities from Moscow to Rio. It seems to ask, like so much of Orozco's work, how can you make something that's material through and through out of so little? Certainly not using the protocols of painting, though it might happen to be painted. And it's nothing, and it's not nothing rather that Sorry, I'll say that again. It's not nothing that it sort of gathers to itself those disparate elements from the history of geometric abstraction. But it's also just like a logo or sign. It's mobile in that way. The whole idea of painting barely holds up as 
holds up to separate scrutiny apart from the other things that he makes. They're only makeable, these paintings, within the context of dispersal that characterizes his work. The painted shapes spread across the objects and terracotta shapes on a working table, migrating abstract signs distributed across a precarious object world, which in turn reflects back on us as viewers who muster rather than master such a dispersed field. Now, instead of a work table in the Tate show, there's this new work. It's called Chihotes, um, made in 2010. And it fills one room on the riverside and rhymes in its movement with the flow of the Thames below. It's distributed across the floor now. Um, and, and distributed across the floor are the shreds of numerous burnt out tires, tires that were found on roadsides as Orozco drove out to find plant and cactus skeletons in the desert, the natural reserves and biospheres in various parts of Mexico um, during 2009. Now these tires, these burnt out tires, Chicotes is the word for burnt out tire. They have tendrils that are surprisingly delicate, like plants. And it doesn't really show, but in the distance, and I'm sure you remember from the work, there are these puddles of aluminium that are actually the melted down metal hubcaps. Um, now these look this looks about as far away from painting as you can get, and yet they form circles on the floor that echo, obviously, uh, the circles in the drawings and the paintings. This could be seen as a partner piece almost to his Pensky project, which he'd made earlier in New York in hiring a Pensky removal van and collecting debris um, from skips and making temporary materials um, of temporary arrangements of the materials, temporary sculptures, if you like, that he photographed. Um, and there are some works that are made of the leftovers, like these boxes filled with plasticine balls. I think the boxes were actually originally, they were found in skips, but they originally held um, film strips. You know, they were. <clears throat> but now with the Chicotes, it's nature's um, debris, if you like, that's at stake. It's not so unlike um, the way in which bits and pieces he's gathered from the desert floor, the debris of plant life set in plaster, other bits and pieces are in waiting, if you like, on a table in a studio space here in Mexico City. So this is not a work, um, but it's full of work. Now this is the work, and the tires are put in temporary arrangements that will change in each new setting. But I think what I'd like to emphasize is the way that what's at stake in Orozco's work is always the connections, the fragile connections between things, which we could call, perhaps, ecologies of feeling. So if he subtitled that Pensky project, the Industrial Revolution, these could be the Ecological Revolution. And this would resonate, too, with the kinds of conjunction of tree trunk and graphite circle drawing with the leftovers of cacti in other works that resurface in the space of the gallery. I haven't got an image of that. I don't mean that the work is or that the work looks fragile, but that the connections between things, and that extends to works like this as much as it does to the more obviously ready-made. This is laboriously handmade now by a Roscoe rather than an assistant, a reworking of the painting in graphite on gesso, again, a very traditional technique that's prepared in the workshop that I showed you the image of. This is a kind of after drawing now, 
um, which are just as much a part of that sense of ecology, I think, as a cactus skeleton might be. A cactus skeleton is a, a dead cactus plant um, that he has used in various recent sculpture. And this idea extends too, I think, to the relations between the dispersed centers of activity and production. Rather than pan-historical or transcendent, these are the current conditions of dispersal and disarray that the artist works under. I felt sort of uneasy throughout putting geometric abstraction and especially putting painting at the centre of this talk when it's so clearly not the centre of his practice as an artist. But in trying to address the, the work of Orozco that let's face it, is kind of least talked about. I hope I've shown how symbiotic painting is with all the other work and the impossibility almost of thinking it otherwise. The paintings are so clearly um, not enough either to fulfill some sense of aesthetic plenitude on one hand or critical expectations with a more avert political agenda on the other. So for me, um, not enoughness qualifies as an aesthetic, an ethical, a political position for this very reason, offering a resistance precisely because of their resilience as art, a resistance to what we think we know that opens on to the psychic order of globalization creating circuits that short circuit. The eye of the needle of current conditions of making art is, I want to suggest, the makeability of art itself. World making is not and cannot be what it once was. It's vastly expanded. And to be most resilient, I think, the work needs to be attuned to the slightest fault lines to what's barely enough to make, out of, to make art out of, um, to look at the spaces between things, on a table, on a wall, between a digital program and a painted surface, anywhere at all in fact, things that aren't enough to make art out of, or like his painting, to make it in a, in a way that's barely enough to count as painting as such. It's this kind of high risk strategy of near missing that dramatizes the possibilities of making now. And rather than ask why Orozco you know, beat a retreat into painting, um, the question to ask for me looked at from this point of view is how could making paintings not seem like a way of maximizing disturbance within the field of activity that's art? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bryony. That is fascinating way of looking at, you're right, some of the pieces by Roscoe that maybe people look at less, take more for granted as they go through. Um, I kept wondering, um, when you were showing different images of the working tables, uh, how you felt those related to, in a lot of Orozco's work, when I look at it, I see this, there's almost like a sort of um, nostalgia for the authentic. There's a kind of sense of loss, because it's, it's something that, like a painting that isn't a painting. And, uh, or, or, or some of his photographs are of things that they are not, you know, and they, the car that isn't the car, you know, things, things that are, have their thingness, but somehow or other are removed from, from being real, you know, they're kind of, they're real and not real at the same time. Um, and those working tables, you, s I somehow, f I'm anxious when I look at them, because I think, oh my God, I want to look at them and believe, I want to believe that they're tables that are genuinely showing some kind of process. But at the same time, uh, they're really like, 
the, they have that same impossibility about them, don't they? In that they, 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 they're rearranged, they're organised, they, they reflect something that isn't, in fact, a working table at all, and yet it's a working table. I mean, it, it, it exists in both, it doesn't exist, as a reference to, to process and to making. Mm. I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more mm. about that. I'm just no, well, I think, that's, I think that's very interesting. I mean, I think that he's an artist who animates loss in relation to, to gains. Mm. So in some ways, things are taken out of circulation and they, rather, in, rather than adhering or, or sticking to some sense of authenticity, they're immediately kind of transformed by putting into these new circuits in a way. So they're taken out of the circuits that they might have belonged to. And sometimes they are really kind of debris or they can be, you know, failed projects. They're, he's, you know, they're, they're things that didn't work or they're just kind of non sequiturs. But as soon as they enter this, you know, new pattern. The relationship of, of his work that is often viewed as part of those dialogues and debates around drawing and mm. the relationship of that to his play with the idea of the object and how those, those, those things go together. Mm. Because I, I, I suppose on the working table, you have somehow or other a combination of, mm. of the two. And I'd never see, I never thought of the paintings as part of that same dialogue. But then when you see something like your last slide, mm. you have that sense of the, um, the everything almost summed up in this, <laughs> in the football here, don't you know? You've got almost all the different mm. types of works coming together in one. Does, mm. Is this, when's this from, this piece? I think that's about, um, I think that one is possibly from 1998 or 2000. Really? There are a lot yeah. of them, and they're photographs of them also, as they were aging, they originally, you know, age on his terrace, and so they're eroding these footballs, and then he cuts well, everyone, them. Everyone has an eroding football <laughs> on their terrace, don't they? And he can. collects them, and yeah. he has a lot. And they sometimes occur and appear on the working tables, but they're also, they appear in photographs like this one. I mean, I didn't touch on photography, but this mm. is a photograph. But I think, in some ways, there was a time when you know, that sense of the expansion of drawing that could encompass everything in a way, mm, and mm. so much so that the Chicotes could be a drawing on the floor. Yeah. I mean, I'd prefer to see it as a, you know, that's what's happened to the working table. The floor has become a working table. It's not like a Carl Andre floor piece. It's like a kind of expanded working or table. Or whether the Chicotes, whether that's the driving that the cars did before the tires burst is the drawing. You know, it's yeah. kind of like yes. whether you've got these remnants yes. there. It's like the, the kicking of the football and the yeah. movement of yeah. that went on is part of that whole yeah. idea of it kind of doing weathered. the thing before it got caught there, yeah. you know. They've eroded, they've weathered, and that kind of change, they're still eroding. This is his language, not mine, but I think it's very evocative. You know, they, they continue to e erode in the imagination, mm. so they're weathering in the mind, you know, I like that idea. But I think in some ways the idea, this is again a term that he would use and it would bring it together. Well, the diagram is obviously one way of thinking this, and the constellation, so this, and he is, he often uses that planetary constellation but I think not in terms of a transcendentalism, but of some vast expanse which is shrunk onto the most everyday and, you know, kind of modest of things, you know, the most thing-like thing, like this kind of very palpable, you know, remnant of a football. Um, but that idea of a constellation which plots points and is always in movement as well, I think that, does tie everything together. And there's quite, um, you know, Mallarmé has this idea of reconstellating a page um, with the words of a poem. And that idea of constellations and reconstellations, I think that obviously links mm. to drawing, but I think it also exceeds drawing. Because in a way, if everything's drawing, then I've come to feel that 
drawing loses some of its particularity that you might want to keep for drawing. Do you know what I mean? If everything will count as a drawing, which you know we can see the expanded field, and I think that's been very uh, liberating and produced a lot of um, interesting work and interesting thought. But I also think there's, you know, when these things become so capacious, I've noticed that Orozco at one point was talking a lot about drawing being his fundamental way of thinking, but has shifted a little bit away from that. I mean, I don't want to make too much of it, but I mm. think also there's a, you know, that's a, you, you know, maybe just th there was a moment when that seemed to, to really resonate, didn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. Because if sort of the art is sort of permanently making and it's remade each time when so it's exhibited or whatever, the issue of agency of the artist comes in. And uh, what happens after his death? Then this uh, art stops, or is the curator take over that role, or is there some kind of formula you can do it? Mm. So because in one way, if something is, is it interactive in a sense, you see, or is it like almost like a software so that you can use forever if a certain <laughs> formula can be repeated or just it dies with the artist? Mm. Um, I think it absolutely doesn't die with the artist, but I hope it doesn't become simply the preserve of the curator either. I mean, this has been a problem with working on Eva Hesse, that's the problem, because there was an artist who, who made things that could, were, I mean, in some ways I didn't, I think, talk in these terms, but it's what I meant, is that this isn't pure abstraction, it's pure contingency. You know, that means that things are entirely relative to the moment and the situation that they're in. And obviously, Hesse made these things that were meant to be distributed or on the floor, you know, little um, fiberglass buckets and whatever, and they were meant to expand or shrink to the size of the room. There wasn't a fixed way of putting them. But curators always follow the photographs, because she died in 1970 very early, they always follow the photographs of how they have been installed in the past. She's totally crazy. And, but you know, that is the constraints of museums, the, you know, and I think that's terrible, terrible. I know a lot of artists, I don't know about Orozco, kind of think a lot about that and even have worked with museums. I don't think he particularly does. I think that's kind of stultifying also in a way. You know, I think in a way, like most artists, he is much more concerned about continuing to make other work. Um, but I think the logic of it is to be purely contingent. But I don't think it's interactive in the way that, say, a Lydia Clark piece is. I don't think it's performative. It's, it's quite particular. So I think after his death, it's important that that kind of logic is kept alive, really. Um, I mean, these working tables are obviously owned by big museums now. Um, and so they enter another, well, some of them do, are. So they enter another life. And I think one of the things about Orozco's work is that he's already reflected on those movements. It's already very much embedded in the work. I'm really interested in um, what you're saying about notions of resistance and resilience. And I've just been reading um, some of Baraldi's, but I don't even know how, if that's how you say his name, but Franco Biffo Baraldi's thoughts in the book The Soul at Work on ideas of panic and depression as almost strategies of resistance to being co-opted into a dominant system. And just wondered whether you felt there was any kind of parallels or... Um, whether it's an intentional strategy that the artist has, this kind of not, not enoughness, the sort of aiming to disappoint. I mean, he said it is, but I just wondered if you had any more reflections on that in terms of a strategy of resistance. I think the 
other terms that you um, invoke that, you know, maybe psychological like panic and depression are very interesting. In one sense, they seem to be more um, dramatically stated because they're almost more like a protest, aren't they? And certainly, you know, within psychoanalysis, the way, feminist psychoanalysis, the way, uh, say, hysteria would have been seen as a kind of protest. Um, whereas this, um, I think there is a kind of subterfuge here in a mode of resistance, but I think it's dealing with, you know, the smallest, the, you know, the things that almost fall below the threshold of notice. So I think it's slightly different in tone, but I think it is like a resist, you know, and it, I suppose I want to try to hold on something to something in the work um, that can't simply be assimilated to prevailing structures, however, you know, successful the artist in this case becomes. I mean, even to the drift of the, you know, the globalized art market, of which he is, of course, a part. But I think there's something about the work that does offer a resistance. I can't, I mean, I do think there's a, a psychic element to this. I know I only kind of hinted at it, and I couldn't find a way of identifying, for instance, you know, depression, uh, panic, schizoid, all the kinds of terms that might have been mobilized in criticism. I'm not sure I'd want to label it, but I think there is this sense of a, you know, as well as a social and political order of globalization, there's also a psychic order of globalize, globalization. And I think that's to do with the way things circulate in the world. So I can't quite answer your question, but I think it's a really interesting one because I would want to suggest that it's something, I suppose, closer to Duchamp's, you know, infra-thin. And you were talking about Duchamp earlier and, you know, that idea of the amframance, you know, the, the slight, you know, resist, the sound of two bits of corduroy rubbing together, you know, something like that. Um, rather more than, a, you know, melancholy or the depressive, I don't, I don't know. Isn't it just a sort of the illusion? Only the illusion of Orozco exists. And uh, so the material could be, anybody can find that similar uh, shredded tire and uh, arranged by curator. So what makes him unique? Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a question that I guess could be addressed to the whole of 20th century art. Yeah, that is my question. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I would fundamentally, you know, disagree with the sentiment of your question, obviously, because I think that he's one of the artists who, I think how you make things doesn't necessarily mean that the artist has to make it himself clearly. And I mean, I'm sure there are many artists here, so it's not for me to in some way say this, but the way I understand this is that artists make worlds. Orozco makes a world that you, is so distinctive, is so unlike the world that's made by other artists. <coughs> it's so incredibly powerful as a kind of imaginative world. It only makes sense in its whole kind of crazy expansiveness. And I suppose the logic of it, I think, is very powerful. And actually, this is an artist who I was showing you things, I guess, that he doesn't make. But he is an artist who actually hand makes a lot of what he does.
does. He makes all those ceramics. He makes all those, a lot of the things on the working table. So in one sense, what he does is to put, oh, I suppose, he puts next to each other things that are very palpably handmade, that, as you say, can look like an original mould. Yes, somebody else could do it, but they didn't do it. You know, he's made those terracotta shapes. He's made, you know, in the most kind of, in some ways, a sense of an originary coming into being of the art object, of a sculpture. But it's put next to something that might be completely mass-produced. So in some ways, he, you know, asks questions about the relationships between handmade and ready-made things that maybe we just take for granted but he kind of opens that to a different kind of thinking, I think. Um, I just had a question about um, really the kind of balancing act that you seem to be um, achieving in the way that you are talking about and writing about art at the moment or recently between... Um, what seems to be, an un, for an art historian, an unusual sensitivity to and attention to materials, processes, and trying to deep, deeply understand the kind of structure of an artist's practice. Um, and obviously, perhaps unusually as well, perhaps for an art historian, you're given access to, or you, you've, you've achieved access to, uh, the artist and to material like the working books that may be an art historian dealing with something much more distant in time and space may or may not have the same kind of access to or would have a different kind of access to not through the artist as an individual and 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 the the, the kind of balancing act between a sensitivity to the kind of materials forms and processes on the one hand and um, the way in which one might like to draw conclusions about the bigger, maybe the social implications, the political implications of the practice, the way in which the world of his work having its own internal logic might relate to the broader world. Uh, I mean, at the start of your talk, you implied that you wanted to kind of make a shift in interpretation away from certain earlier readings of his work, uh, and you mentioned nomadism and relational aesthetics and earlier debates. And, and then, anyway, I just wondered whether you might say something about that, about almost like how you see your method as a writer or something at the moment. Another really easy question. <laughs> it's a big one. Well, um, I mean, Thank you for that, and I mean, that is basically what I'm interested in, mm. is how you do that. And I, that is what I try to do. I hope I wrote like that, or tried to write like that, before I had access, maybe, but I only yeah. had access to those notebooks because he was going to exhibit them, okay. actually, um, which he didn't in the end. They were originally going to be shown and they have been you know in some ways they've become part of the work and so that's what I wrote about it wasn't actually that I had but there are certain things and certain things that I decided not to show actually because I felt they weren't the work and that wasn't right because the artist you know things that I might have just snapped on my camera that I queried even that table in the studio with just stuff uh, there are other things you know and I feel that is an ethical decision in some ways so I worried over that but what I'm really interested in is how you can be both inside and outside the work at the same time and I know that I tend to be very inside it you know and I that's what I'm that's what I think is a valid task mm. of writing. But obviously the point is not simply to paraphrase or duplicate in some ways the work, or certainly not the, you know, the very articulate artist that you're writing mm. about, um, whoever that might be. And so what I'm kind of interested in and why I'm, I think, quite 
enthralled by this practice is that this almost seems to be emblematic of that you know, almost as if there's a crisis of scale in criticism. And I've, I have a course where, an, a master's course where we look at that, a, a crisis of scale where there are these extraordinary kind of very persuasive discursive frameworks in which globalization is discussed, often at the expense of the kind of particularity of art as a practice or a theoretical set of proposals. And myself, I came through, I suppose, thinking about psychoanalysis, which was another sort of huge narrative for thinking about art, but feel now very much that it, I want the art work to do the theoretical work. And so I, that's what I'm really interested in. It's not necessarily what the artist's intention is. I hope it's not simply that, because otherwise I don't think it would be particularly interesting. But I think it's hard to get right, that kind of disproportion that in one sense is this, you know, these very large issues and often something that seems almost nothing. And so I think I'm also very antagonistic, and maybe that was a subtext in what I was trying to say to the the way in which the kind of attention or close looking that I think is important is sometimes dismissed as a kind of formalism uh, very easily by um, within certain kind of critical discourses mm. because it seems to me that where an ethical position is for a subject is not necessarily where it says it is. I mean, psychoanalysis tells us that. So it is about finding a position to to kind of write from. Um, but I think it is not necessarily resolved and I think it's a really important question because obviously sometimes, not always, but sometimes the artwork can be still reduced to that which is a kind of illustration. And, you know, this has been the case for a long time. That it's, not easy, it's not difficult to see how a certain theoretical framework is incredibly complicated because it's hard to understand. It's actually quite difficult to show how complex or subtle an artwork might be. And if it's not, frankly, as complex as Agamben or Lacan, you know, it's a ridiculous proposition, I think, mm. to think that art is any less complicated or profound than those theoretical frameworks. And, I mean, that sounds terribly pretentious and I don't mean that I've attained that, but that would be my feeling. It seems ridiculous to think that art could be any less, any less um, important in its own terms than any of those other frameworks. This is the right forum for that statement. <laughs> well, well, I'm often on the defensive, as you can imagine, making this within the world of art history. This is not something that would be necessarily taken for granted or could, would very happily be thought of as, uh, as formalist. Um, hi. Um, after view the exhibition of Orozco in Tate Britain, uh, Tate Modern, um, well, I think he, I thought he's almighty. He made everything, uh, installations, paintings, photography, and uh, he has lot of variation in his work. Um, but after, I'm a little confused because I think as an artist is quite important. He has his own identity and uh, um, how to say um, 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 he has own his own features. Um, but I think Orozco, um, how, how can I say? Um, I think I can see a very specific, preci precise um, feature in his works because he made everything and um, he seems got inspirations from every minute in life and every details so I think um, how how, um, how how do you think about this point I yeah he his works are so, so broad yeah like, it's hard it, to it give his uh, definition or 
Um, do you think it's hard to see, um, to identify a work by him as an artist? Would you find it difficult to identify something that he's made? Yeah. This is where I kind of interested because I am obvious, you know, I'm very inside it and I, I find it one of the things that I think is striking about the work is that it can be all sorts of things and yet it's kind of unmistakable if you see what I mean. I know um, it look, yeah, it looks like he's made it. And, and one of the criticisms that sometimes made of him as an artist is that there is this idea that you know, what he does and what he mainly does is simply to kind of glance and touch and make it his own. You know, whether it's a football, whether it's a rag on the ground, that there's something very, you know, they're always central, the photographs, the things are always, you know, there's something very structural about the way he makes photographs, the thing is always centred, um, it's framed in a certain way, um, and so in some ways it is eclectic, You're, and he does work in this manifold, you know, with different kinds of sources, I think. He works in terracotta, he works with photographs, but I think in some ways so many artists work, don't they, with many different, you know, modalities like that, or at least he's, you know, he's one of many. And I think in some ways he comes out of a moment in the 80s and 90s where that became a kind of necessity almost, when that kind of eclecticism or heterogeneity was kind of important. I think it's important to him that he's not an abstract artist, he's not a painter. You can't actually call him any of these things. If you were going to call him something, I think he'd probably prefer to be called a sculptor. He sees himself as a sculptor. He definitely doesn't see himself as a photographer or in any way interested in photography as such, in the way that so many artists are interested in photography. He just happens to take photographs. So in some ways, I think there's a, you know, I'm not saying that he's like so many other artists, but I think in some ways that's become... Well, photographs, are, photographs that aren't sculptures, like his paintings and paintings that aren't paintings. Exactly, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, in answer to your question, I don't think that's a problem. Obviously, I think that's what makes the work um, have this complex life because he's, he breaks down the apparent oppositions that exist, for instance, between nature and culture, the geometric and the organic. He makes things where the geometric doesn't actually belong to the industrial, but belongs to the handmade. You know, he mixes and muddles up all the kinds of connotations that, you know, we kind of think in. So I think in some ways it's necessary to mix up, you know, the organic and the geometric precisely in order to, to break them down. Thank you. And uh, do you mean uh, um, that, uh, do you think, um, um, and a complex artist can't have, he can has his very strong identity. Yes, of course. I, I think he does have a very strong identity. That's what I mean about artists making worlds. I think that can be like Orozco using, and I think necessary for his practice. This, you know, difference, the variation, the range of it. But so too can a painter, you know, so too can Mondrian make a world, that's the point. You know, sticking to a certain kind of abstract painting, you know, um, for 20, 20 years, you know, doing, doing the, you know, I absolutely doesn't depend on making lots of different kinds of things. And that's what I, I suppose I'm trying to get at, is that I don't think there's anything essential about painting that makes it such. Whereas in the earlier 20th century, 
you know, leading up to, you know, abstract expressionism, there was a sense that abstract painting was the, you know, the, the, the most ambitious kind of art because it was abstract and because it was painting. And I think what happens in the 1960s is that that kind of medium specificity, you know, that sense of painting being the sole place where that can happen, that kind of disperses. So you get this hybridity, as it's been <coughs> called, you know, where you could, in fact, do that through painting, but it's not necessary that it's painting. I think that's the point, that that's become more productive, I think, and I think that's, uh, that's been very um, generative of a lot of good, good work. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I guess I, I just wanted to ask something a little bit more about um, the sort of generative quality of his work. I, there's something about uh, the way that much of what he does um, is about setting up um, a situation or a set of rules that then kind of can play out in an infinitely mm. varied way. I um, mean, it's easy to sort of picture uh, making a computer program that could sort of do that and that he, you know, he might take that approach, but that he very carefully resists that by slowing things down in a really dramatic way, kind of setting it up as if it could just sort of happen over and over again and go on forever in a way. The games, I think, sort of function that way. Um, but then he, with the paintings in particular, finds a way of just sort of really, really putting the brakes on and making it happen in a very, very different way. Could you talk a little bit about you know, his practice in relation to sort of you know, generative or you know, computer-made works? Uh, have you thought about it from that angle, or do you see any connection? Can you say a little bit more? That is interesting. Um, well, I, let's say the... Um, an iTunes visualizer or something, you know, you sort of, as an abstract, as a maker of abstract images, you have to sort of come to grips today, I think, with the, um, a situation where you have this machine that can make 10 million variations on a theme very, very quickly, many of which are very interesting to look at, and just sort of does its thing. You set up the rules and it goes. Um, it seems like he, he toys with that as a methodology, as, as part of his practice, but then He's also trying to sort of turn it around and, and mm. slow it down with the, with the craft processes mm. that you were so careful to highlight. And I think that's a really interesting tension. Um, I was just curious if there was yeah, no, he, anything no, no, he, about that. I think it's a really important part of his work. And I think he did, and I didn't show it because it's kind of very difficult to show, but he did make an animation of all I think I'm right, it's 677 variations of that Samurai Tree program. And he made it as a, it, it was as a light box actually, and it was exhibited once with a lot of the paintings, and I thought that combination was really very effective because it kind of detracted from the slightly fetishy quality of some of the paintings to have this animation that's just flicking through like a flip book. And it, it works a bit like an animation because you can imagine they're so similar, they kind of bleed yeah. into one another. And so, and it just sits on the wall. Um, and I think that, in a way, animates some of those ideas. Yeah. It also puts it in time in an interesting way and highlights the kind of, you know, the speed of looking. The other thing that he did from the beginning, and I think probably where his interest or the first inclinations towards using computers at all, came from these kind of digital printouts being the basic paper format that he worked with. You know, like they're, they were um, like odd variations on the grid. And he would use this as the you know, almost a template for drawing. And there's some of them, I think, in the tape where he'll then fill them in by hand, you know, working the digital drawings, working out by hand. Um, and I think that sense of putting those two things together, because after all, especially when he's beginning to make those, I suppose, through the 90s, and I'm not so hot on this, you know, I may be wrong with my time, like I'm sure people will know better, but you know that whole kind of, you know, the dream of a, the computer age that it would be a paperless world, which is so clearly not been the case.
case in, in a way, well, not rather like my study in a way, you know, that kind of sense of, you know, just produces more and more paper. But I think that is quite interesting, the way in which he puts that digital virtual world or the possibilities of it next to a paper world in a very palpable way. Um, 